There's a lot of discussion about the defense budget in Washington today, about waste, fraud, and abuse. You hear about $900 hammers, etc. But the real reason Washington spends so much on its military is because it's tasked with doing a lot of different things. And one of those things is maintaining a security commitment to dozens of countries in Europe. That costs money. So if you want to cut military spending, you're going to have to cut roles and missions. And one of those missions is NATO. In the late 1940s, when we created the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, our European allies were broke and we uh, were concerned that they would either be overrun by the Soviet Union or would succumb to internal communist revolutions. That's why we put troops in Europe. That's why we created NATO. Uh, since then, they've gotten rich and they have more than enough capability to defend themselves. So the New Deal is sort of, we agree to defend them and they agree to let us. Now Europe's GDP is greater than the United States and their population is greater than the United States. So the notion that we need to continue to defend a continent that is eminently capable of defending itself is absurd. One of the big problems with NATO is that it infantilizes our allies. Secretary Gates gave a speech last year in which he lamented that European countries had let their militaries atrophy to a point where they couldn't really assist the United States in any meaningful way in ongoing conflicts. Despite the need to spend more on vital equipment for ongoing missions, the Alliance has been unwilling to fundamentally change how it sets priorities and allocates resources. Part of this problem is NATO. Uh, in fact, when the United States is willing to foot the bill for the defense of Europe, it's not unreasonable that Europeans would allow us to pay for European security. NATO requires all member states to spend at least 2% of their GDP on defense. In fact, only four countries in NATO actually do that. Uh, the United States, by comparison, spends over 5% of GDP on defense when you include the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So while the alliance requires states to, def to spend more on defense, as a practical matter, our spending so much allows them all to spend far less. They have no great incentive to spend more knowing that the United States is going to provide these services for them. But we believe that there are certain commitments, as we saw on a bipartisan basis, to NATO. Uh, that need to be embedded in the DNA of American foreign policy and not sort of beginning and ending and fits and starts. The engagement has to remain constant. The United States ought to have allies for war, not war for allies. And I think we've gotten that confused because of our permanent alliances. The Secretary of Defense, in one of the flimsier rationales for what we're doing in Libya now, said that we had to be there because our allies are. That we don't have a vital interest, but they thought they had a vital interest, and because they helped us in Afghanistan, we had to help them uh, in Libya. And to me, that's just absurd. If our allies are in Afghanistan just because of an alliance, that's a mistake we shouldn't emulate in Libya. And this is sort of a reminder why 18th century Americans were against permanent alliances. They thought they might pull us into war. Just to illustrate the absurdity of NATO, the United States recently had to buy precision-guided munitions to give them to the Europeans because they were running out of them in the Libya campaign. So now we have a ridiculous situation where America is borrowing money from China to buy precision-guided munitions to give to the Europeans to drop on Libya. This Rube Goldberg theory of foreign policy is ridiculous.